Good evening, uh, and thank you for coming to the Center for Strategic International Studies. My name is Andrew Schwartz, and I'm uh, Vice President for External Relations here, and have the great pri privilege of working with Bob Schieffer and the TCU uh, school, uh, Schieffer School of Journalism in this fantastic series that we have uh, in foreign policy and national security. And as you can see, we're going to talk tonight about foreign policy and the challenges the next administration is going to have. Um, we have a, an absolute all-star panel. Uh, including our own Arno de Borgrave, who has been a journalist for some 60 years. And when I asked Arno once who was the most interesting person you've ever interviewed, he didn't miss a beat and he told me it was Charles de Gaulle. So you can see what kind of experience we have on this panel. Uh, and I, I'm sorry to embarrass Arno, but I, I just love him and it's so good to have him on this panel with all of our, all of our other friends. And, and with that, I'll, I'll throw it to Bob Schieffer and, uh, and thanks for coming to CSIS for the series. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andy, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, this is the partnership uh, between uh, TCU and CSIS, and we're very proud of it at, uh, at TCU, and it has really uh, gotten the name uh, out there, and we, we like being associated uh, with CSIS. It's, it's a great thing. And I'd also like to say I'm very pleased to see General Scowcroft today. Uh, Appreciate having you. This uh, adds a little more prestige. Just to have you. <laughs> it's good to see you. And uh, uh, Arno, of course, uh, 30 years at Newsweek. Uh, he covered most of the world's major news events, including 18 wars. At uh, the age of 21, he became the Brussels bureau chief for UPI. Three years later, named uh, Newsweek's bureau chief in Paris. At 27, uh, became senior editor of the magazine. He held that position for 25 years became editor-in-chief of the Washington Times in 1985, held that job until 1991, and then became associated for the first time with the CSIS. So we're glad to have you here, Arno. Uh, uh, Bill Crystal, uh, everybody knows Bill, editor and publisher of the Weekly uh, Standard, uh, widely recognized as one of the uh, country's leading political commentators. I insisted on ideological balance. Uh, today, so I insisted we have someone from the New York Times. <laughs> well, I'm glad you can be here uh, to fill that role. Susan Page is my uh, old buddy. Uh, uh, she's a Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today. She also appears each week uh, on the Journalist Roundtable on CNN's uh, Sunday morning interview program, Late Edition. Uh, she's won uh, numerous awards and, among other things, uh, is married to Carl Ludendorff. Uh, who is the bureau chief for the uh, Dallas Morning News and uh, one of our, my oldest friends, Clarence Page, uh, no relation, has been a columnist. We're married, but not to each other. <laughs> <laughs> columnist and uh, member of the editorial staff of the Chicago Tribune. His column is uh, syndicated nationally. Uh, he is also an analyst on the McNeil uh, or the Jim Lehrer News Hour. Uh, he won the uh, Pulitzer in 1989 uh, for commentary. He also was part of a team that won another uh, Pulitzer for the newspaper uh, in 1972. Ed Henry, CNN's uh, senior White House correspondent, uh, has just taken that role. And congratulations to you on that. I've known Ed uh, since we covered Capitol Hill together. Back in those days, he was working for Roll Call <laughs> and uh, came to – how long have you been at CNN? Uh, almost five years almost five years and was very involved uh, in this year's uh, campaign. So uh, enough of introductions here. Uh, let's uh, get right to it. And I think we have to start, uh, Clarence. I hear there's a little news story out in your uh, territory out there in Chicago. <laughs> Nothing ever what? happens in Chicago. What are you talking about? <laughs> what Quiet little place. What world is going on out there, and, and what is this thing all about? Well, uh, I hear that uh, the governor has been selling a Senate seat uh, on eBay. Uh, and, uh, that's, uh, but that's just a bit much. But uh, no, even as uh, I had to turn myself away from the TV to come over here because uh, President-elect Obama is having a news conference even as we speak, speak uh, uh, thinking, hoping, imagining that we will actually be interested in energy policy uh, right now. But I can guess that he won't get a single question about energy policy by the time it gets to the reporters. But um, at this point, um, we have a... Uh, governor who is um, somewhat in seclusion, um, but uh, he uh, uh, is uh, uh, planning his next move uh, while the legislature uh, was going to move toward uh, impeachment and a special election, but the Democratic-controlled legislature realized if we have a free election, 
a Republican might win. Uh, so suddenly pl plans shifted about noon today. You know, the whole discussion just went around to uh, some, some other measure, you know, like uh, impeachment and let the lieutenant governor step in, which can take months, uh, leaving us with one empty seat uh, there for the, for the Senate, unless maybe, maybe uh, uh, Bogdanovich appoints himself, because nobody else wants to take the job now. Well, I was going to say, it, it seems to be a little danger that he would appoint anyone, because, I mean, who would, who would accept it? Who would take it? But you don't really realistically think he would appoint himself to you, do you? I wouldn't have realistically thought he'd be after my job last week. I told him the last Tuesday morning when I found out he'd, uh, he was uh, sticking down our corporation to have editorial writers fired, which, um, and, and secondly, it was so dis disappointing that nobody in Chicago rose up in protest over that. <laughs> but when they heard it was about Wrigley Field, then they got mad. But you don't, you don't really at this point, uh, do you think now that the legislature is not going to move to impeach him? I think they will uh, move to impeach, but uh, just beginning the, pro the process of that you know, takes, takes a while. And, you're talking, and of course, he'll ha actually have a right to defend himself, uh, which if he takes that, it could uh, go on for months. I, I imagine, you know, trying to imagine what's going on in the governor's head right now, that he's probably um, thinking about how to plea bargain with the U.S. attorney. Uh, that's what I would think. Uh, but then again, I wouldn't have, have, have laid down this David Mamet uh, dialogue on the, uh, on the uh, U.S. attorney's uh, recorder either. Uh, but I, I think that would, that w it would make sense, though, because in the prosecutor's handbook, they do um, encourage plea bargains in this kind of situation to avoid uh, further delay to the state and the process and all that. All right. Well, there's another big story, and I don't know if you all caught this uh, on the way in, but this afternoon, uh, Caroline Kennedy... Uh, let it be known that she is interested in Hillary Clinton's seat um, in the Senate uh, from New York. Susan, yes. where does this go? Well, the New York Times broke this story about uh, about noon, and it took uh, only a call or two to confirm it, the rest of us. So the I've got to assume that Caroline Kennedy wanted this story to come out today. Uh, it's hard to imagine that if she wants the Senate seat that her uncle once held, that she could be denied. Uh, we We were at a dinner... Uh, last Saturday night where David Patterson, the governor of New York, spoke, was very coy about, uh, about who he'd appoint to the Senate seat. But, uh, but she, she would be certainly, I think, a popular, very well known, uh, uh, in some ways hard to imagine why she wants to be in the U.S. Senate. Uh, but uh, but if she, she seems to be uh, headed there. Well, anyone who would want this appointment would certainly be wanting to campaign for it when they right. don't have to run. Yeah. I, is it hard for you to ima imagine Caroline Kennedy mm -hmm. standing outside some manufacturing plant <laughs> at 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> shaking hands with the people <laughs> just coming off the night shift? I mean, uh, this is... Uh, it's, you know, so the, the po people who run for public office put up with a lot. They put up a lot with raising money, seeking votes in, in, uh, in, in places like plant gates. Um, on the other hand, she's seen politics up close her whole life. Uh, so one can only assume that she has some sense of what she'd be getting into if she's appointed to this seat and then run again, runs again in two years. Does anyone here think that she's going to get the active help of uh, Hillary Clinton? Hmm. Not initially. It seems like she maybe had some other uh, candidates in mind. And I think, as Susan points out, it's going to be a tough race. I mean, she initially could be appointed, but then she'd have to run in 2010. Uh, for the final two years of Hillary Clinton's term, and then have to run again in 2012. So you're talking about raising, you know, something like 30 million dollars per race, uh, and doing all of this campaigning and getting out there. And as you know, Bob, there's a not a good track record for appointed senators getting reelected. A lot of times, uh, the person who's sort of handpicked ends up getting their clock cleaned. Now, this could be a different case because she's somebody who obviously has amazing name recognition. She's been very reluctant, though, to get into the spotlight, so that's what would be fascinating. Uh, she got out there just sort of a, sort of a tippy-toe out there uh, in uh, President-elect Obama's VP search. She was helping uh, with the vetting, uh, and, and all involved said she did a fine job, but that's a lot different than actually being the candidate yourself. Now, the most disappointed person has to be Chuck Schumer, who thought finally he could actually be the senior senator from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an extremely bright part of this, uh, <laughs> happy part of this story, I think. That Chuck Schumer, he, who I like personally and I've known a long time, but nonetheless he's a congressman. He runs for the Senate, beats an incumbent, Al D'Amato in 98. There he is, the, you know, the senior Democrat. Moynihan's going to retire two years later. This is his moment to be the senior senator. 
from the great state of New York. Hillary Clinton shows up and uh, dominates the news in 99, 2000, and she's running and then is elected. And even though Schumer is nominally the senior senator, uh, somehow Hillary Clinton got a little more attention over the last eight years. And now she goes into the cabinet, and you know, and now he's free to suddenly fly, uh, <laughs> step forth and blossom. And now Caroline Kennedy shows up. It's sort of, <laughs> if you know Chuck Schumer, you're sort of amused by this, I would say. <laughs> well, I, I <laughs> must also say, I, you know, after, after Hillary Clinton, I mean, after uh, Caroline Kennedy was so quick to endorse Barack Obama early on, mm -hmm. I think it'll be a cold day in New York before you see <laughs> yeah. uh, Secretary of State Clinton. I'm sure that she will take the nonpartisan role that secretaries of state always do in this particular case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she's going to be anxious to get out there and campaign for Any resemblance between this panel and foreign policy is purely going <laughs> Well, uh, you know, uh, the, strength, uh, the strength of American foreign policy depends on domestic yeah. policy. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, uh, it is an elective system that we have here. Right Thank now. you, so Bob. We have, to get the, uh, we have to get the domestic politics settled first and uh, and then that's what uh, is the basis for all of our foreign policy, I think. But so anything involving Chicago neighborhoods is foreign policy, yeah. believe me. Well, let's talk a little bit about this. And why don't you talk a little bit about this, Arno? What do you see as the, uh, as the main priorities that Obama has to set here uh, on foreign policy? Because the, uh, in, in addition to domestic politics, he's also got a little problem about money and a financial does, crisis. Which limits his... Uh, yes. We'll talk a little abroad. bit about that. Number one, I would list Afghanistan. Number two, I would list Iran. And number three, the Middle East or the perennial uh, Israel-Palestinian problem. But Afghanistan has become very urgent. They're now blowing up dozens of uh, supply trucks coming up through Afghanistan to uh, resupply NATO forces and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Uh, about 200 have been destroyed in the past week. Now we've discovered through some very good reporting in the London Times last week that uh, they are paying off Taliban not to destroy these trucks. And in some cases, Taliban fighters get aboard the truck and lead them through roadblocks. So in other words, we are paying for all of this. It's about $1,000 per truck to get through uh, to Afghanistan. And there are two supply roads. One is 1,200 miles. The other is 600 miles. And uh, I don't think anybody's taken, really taken cognizance of how serious that situation has become. Plus the fact that we have uh, only three NATO allies are willing to do any fighting there. That's Canada, the Netherlands, and, uh, and the, the Brits. Uh, the others have 45 different caveats against doing any fighting. Uh, so it's a very difficult situation, and I think uh, one that uh, will require uh, President Obama's immediate attention, and not strictly in terms of moving more troops over there, because that can't be the solution. One of the outgoing NATO commanders said it would take about 400,000 troops to make any kind of a difference in Afghanistan, a country the size of France. So whatever troops are put in would, in my judgment, be to enhance a bargaining position. We are roughly where we were after the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, and negotiations with Taliban have become inevitable. What are we trying to do in Afghanistan? Are we trying to establish some sort of a, a Williamsburg on the... Uh, well, the idea was to... Ever there, or can I mean, has this ever been a nation as we think of a nation being? Uh, no, and is that, that, that what we're trying to do, or what exactly are we trying to do? Despite the fact that only 3% uh, of uh, Afghan women can read and write, and 16% of the men can do the same, uh, they all know that uh, they've always gotten rid of the foreigner over centuries, including Alexander the Great, who couldn't wait to get out of there and finally found a way out through the Khyber Pass. The Brits, uh, back in 1842, lost... 15,000 men. They killed everyone except one guy so he could live to tell the story. And the Soviet Union, we know what happened to them. Uh, they had 150,000 men, and they're chuckling now because they think that we're doing, we're repeating all the mistakes that they made. So uh, it's, uh, that's why I listed as number one. Number two, of course, is Iran. Uh, there again, we have three former central commanders, uh, General Zinni, Admiral Fallon, and uh, General Abizaid, who have all said at one time or another that we should learn to live with an, an Iranian bomb, obviously with something in return, geopolitically, a big bargain. Uh, whether that's possible, I don't know, but I'm quite sure that President Obama is going to try to feel his way through that uh, thicket. Um, and then the Middle East, of course, we know about. No need to go into that again. Other than that, I think he's... Uh Everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Don't forget it, Pakistan. It, it, fascinating to hear well, you walk around 
the situation and not even mention Iraq. All those are, are big challenges, as you point out. I agree with all of them. Um, but then the, you just had President Bush take this secret trip to Iraq. A reminder again, you've got over 100,000 troops there, and it's going to be a very difficult uh, situation for President-elect Obama. And I think one of the biggest challenges for him um, is figuring out how quickly to bring those troops home. I mean, he made that promise in the campaign to bring them home within 16 months. And when he picked Secretary Gates uh, to stay on at the Pentagon, he specifically said in that press conference a couple of weeks back that Secretary Gates will have a new mission, which is to bring our troops home. But then he sort of added a couple of caveats near the end of the press conference about it's going to depend on conditions on the ground. You've got to pay attention to that. Um, and it was interesting, President Bush yesterday on his way back on Air Force One told reporters, that he said something effective, I don't want to put words in President-elect Obama's mouth, but I think that Secretary Gates pick sent a signal um, that he's going to carefully study what's going on on the ground. Is he going to be able to sort of stretch out that promise of 16 months in terms of all combat troops or not? Uh, that was a big promise, obviously, for his supporters. Uh, and it's sort of fascinating that uh, Barack Obama's campaign was largely launched at the beginning about change in Iraq. Now, as you point out, Bob, it's really been overtaken by the financial crisis. And I think, as you point out as well, Afghanistan is a war that everyone seems to be talking about now a lot more than Iraq. But it's a war we can't forget about. It's obviously a big What do you think, Iraq, for uh, the simple reason, Ed, let me, uh, the situation is improving there day to day? Sure. Uh, let me go to Bill. Uh, how do you, you, you were on the other side. Uh, how do you think Obama's done so far? And uh, is he getting, I mean, I think it's been, as far as I'm concerned, one of the smoothest transitions that I, I can really recall in a long, long time. But the other part is smooth transitions don't always mean you're going to have a smooth presidency. And sometimes, I mean, Ronald Reagan didn't have all that great a transition. Uh, there's a good Bill Clinton, of course, and it took him two years really to recover from it. But how do you think Obama's done so far? I think he's done fine in, in foreign policy. I, I think it's as good, a, from my point of view, as good a group as uh, certainly I could have expected, and actually a pretty good group, period. I mean, uh, um, but I, I took about 10 minutes to look at what happens in the first year of incoming administration's uh, tenure in the world. And a lot happens, typically, and a lot of it's unpredictable. And I mean, I'm sure President-elect Obama knows this. That we can sit here and say it's likely to be, I mean, it, the, obviously these are major crises, major problems we've been talking about. But of course, things can happen where no one much expects anything to happen, and um, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure they will. But I know I think it's a serious team. Uh, I think Iran is a tough. I mean, will be the clock. The, the two clocks on Iran don't quite match up. He wants to do his diplomatic initiative, which of course he'll do. Um, that's going to take a little while. There's an Iranian election. When is that? In May. It's hard to see if you can get much going before then. Uh, you've got to get the Europeans <laughs> coordinated, and the nuclear clock is. Hard to know, but it seems to be ticking pretty quickly there. And um, if, you know, he, I don't think he wants to simply stumble. He may make a policy decision that the cost of trying to use force to prevent a nuclear rod are greater than the, than, than the benefits. But I don't think he wants to just sort of let that happen inadvertently. So there will be some moment, I would think, in '09 or maybe early '010, where he really has some major decisions to make or to go to the Europeans and say, "Are we really serious now about a big ramping up of sanctions?" You know, we can decide, and certainly General Zinni and everyone can decide that we are okay with a nuclear Iran, but there are other actors here who may not be okay with it, mm -hmm. and not just Israel, who everyone focuses on. I mean, the great threat of the nuclear Iran to me is not that they're likely to use a nuclear weapon against Israel or, or against us, probably not even, though this is more risky, that they'll provide a nuclear umbrella for terror, but that they just set off a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. I mean, the Saudis and the Egyptians aren't going to sit there and say, well, fine, Iran gets nuclear weapons, and we're going to depend well, then on what? On nothing right now. Now, maybe you could argue, and people will make this argument, we'll have extended deterrence, as we did for Europe in the Cold War. We're now going to defend, I don't know, are we going to really offer a nuclear guarantee to the Saudi regime? That's a little, I mean, it's, we do a lot with the Saudi regime, but a public guarantee of, you know, against, I mean, that we're willing to risk a nuclear exchange for the sake of their, of their uh, sovereignty or territory, I mean, that's a pretty tough thing, I should think. So I think Iran really is a huge item you know, sort of that Obama, President Obama is going to have to deal with very fast. On Afghanistan, I would just say, I think there, I think that's been the good war. And the Democrats in particular, who were anti-Iraq for, you know, for their own reasons, I mean, for what they thought were good reasons, but very much wanted to go out of the way to show they weren't simply against fighting the war on terror and they weren't, you know, the govern I doves, so they were for a tough policy in Afghanistan and even for an increase in troops there. Honestly, and I say this is, I think no one was a stronger supporter of the surge in Iraq than me. I, I don't think the arguments have been laid out as carefully 
for the surge in Afghanistan as they were in Iraq. Uh, maybe they have been, obviously, just doing this work within the Defense Department and elsewhere, but I, on the outside, certainly, I don't think one can see the level of preparation that really did exist for the surge in Iraq, and serious people like General Keene, the former Army Vice Chief of Staff, and General Petraeus himself had really worked this through and thought it had a pretty good chance of success. So I think on Afghanistan there's a real danger politically to the president-elect that he'll, he'll send a couple more brigades clearly over the next three, four, five months. I think that's already pretty much set up. But if the situation starts to deteriorate, you will get two things at once, I think. On the left wing of the Democratic Party, they say, well, why exactly are we you know, intervening more deeply in this country? Can't we do this in other ways? Uh, can't we negotiate? Can't we? And from the Republican Party, and I say this not as, I hope this doesn't happen, but I suspect it will, a certain um, reassertion of a much more traditional Republican wariness about foreign involvements, wariness about nation building, uh, distrust of the Obama administration. We saw this under Clinton a lot, uh, um, you know, the Republican opposition on the Hill to Bosnia and Kosovo. And you could get Republicans turning from being a sort of hawkish interventionist party to a sort of, I don't know, fortress America slash, you know, let's be, we don't want to stretch ourselves too thin. I mean, you can have, there are a lot of some of these arguments maybe may be intellectually respectable, I and mean, I'm not, but I just think politically he could have more of an Afghanistan problem than he thinks, or he may think, he may understand this, than people think, six, eight, nine months away. And there, and, and the true, the trouble is it's hard to publicly make the real case for it, but the real case for it, I think, is Pakistan, which is can you really plausibly have an adequate outcome in Pakistan if there's total chaos on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, and therefore you sort of have to stabilize part of Afghanistan to some degree to prevent further destabilization of Pakistan, but that's a pretty complicated But Bill, they have uh, privileged sanctuaries. The Taliban has privileged sanctuaries in Pakistan, and each time we go and bomb them, as you know, it uh, sets up all sorts of suicide bombings all over Pakistan. Yeah, mm -hmm. well. How, what, what shape would you think, uh, I'd just like to get to see what the panel thinks about this. What kind of shape is uh, President Bush leaving Iraq in uh, for this incoming uh, administration? I mean, we saw the pictures, you know, I mean, he goes there and holds a news conference and they throw shoes at him. Uh, it's pretty quiet over there right now. It, it looks a lot better than a I lot of people uh, thought it was well, going to look like. Well, much now. better than anyone thought two years ago. Yeah. And here's the trouble, though. I don't think the drawdown in, Af in Iraq, by taking Secretary Gates, and of course, not even murmuring about replacing Petraeus at CENTCOM or Odierno at MNFI, I do not, I believe Obama has basically, uh, will not do a faster withdrawal than they think is prudent. And I just can't see how we could afford I don't think those men would, would in fact stay in their positions if they thought Obama was really endangering the hard-earned, hard-won success that it, uh, and progress that was made there, which means I don't think we get a very fast drawdown in Iraq. There are provincial elections in January and national elections at the end of the year. The one thing you, that's where you actually, we, that's where the Bush administration always increased troops correctly, I think, because you want to have the most security to have a fair election, to encourage full turnout. It's very important this election that we get Sunni turnout, unlike in 2005. So I think the pace of withdrawal in Iraq will be slow. Now, if casualties stay low, if U.S. casualties stay low, I think he pays very little political price for that. I don't really think the left wing of the Democratic Party it goes crazy if we're not, if combat forces aren't out of there in 16 months. That was the central, central mm -hmm. Yeah, but if the, if, the, if, the, if the casualties are, are down, I think he can get away with if Clinton was going to withdraw troops, I mean, everyone's, everyone comes in saying they're going to draw down troops from places where they don't draw down troops. As long as casualties are low, I think he's okay on that. Well, I think he has, to, he has to begin. Uh, you know, I think that he doesn't necessarily have to meet a 16-month deadline, which through the campaign, you know, after his campaign was launched, he kept hedging it a little bit more, and he did even more, as you noted, uh, at his recent news conference. But I think he's got to get on a trajectory of drawdown. I mean, I don't think he has the option of maintaining, what do we have, about 150,000 troops? It's still uh, there now, more than we had before the surge began. He doesn't have the option of, of continuing that. He's got to be, it seems to me, politically speaking, on a path of reducing, uh, of reducing troop levels, even if it takes longer than he said uh, to, to bring most of the combat troops out. What is that path will be gradual. I mean, there will be 100,000, I will predict right here, and I'll, maybe I'll be wrong, there will be over 100,000 troops in Iraq a year from now. Your I mean, predictions are right on target there, Bill. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. But I, I agree, though, that the uh, left uh, is giving him some uh, problem uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Nation magazine, for example, and uh, a few others. Uh, but uh, polling indicates he hasn't fallen off much from the 91% approval that he had among Democrats at 
on, on, on election day, still right around the mid 80s. And there is a sense, I was at a, a convention of community organizers here uh, in D.C. Uh, last week, which was the first time anybody from the transition team, Valerie Jarrett and one of the other transition officials uh, was, was there because th these are his people, community organizers. He promised them he was going to meet with them in a transition and uh, sent uh, Valerie over. And um, it was quite uh, remarkable. Uh, Valerie Jarrett was actually encouraging uh, the crowd to hold our feet to the fire, kind of like uh, FDR did mm -hmm. back, back when he came in, uh, to keep them on uh, that uh, that trajectory so that they can argue on Capitol Hill that hey, I'm getting trouble from the left. You got to you got to you know give, give me a break here. But uh, uh, we are on a uh, glide path, I believe was the term uh, Colin Powell used uh, toward uh, withdrawal, toward the uh, toward the drawdown in uh, Iraq. Things are going in the right direction. And not too many people are going to quibble with him about, uh, hey, we're not getting out fast enough. Yeah. All right, we want to go to some questions from the audience, but as we're waiting for our first person, we'd like to ask come either to these microphones here. Um, let me just go around the panel. Did anybody expect uh, Barack Obama to name Hillary Clinton as Secretary <laughs> of State? Ed? No, no, not at all. I thought in talking to a lot of senior Obama advisors um, right before the election, right after the election, not about her. Um, that specific job, but about her in general, they, a lot of his senior advisors felt that they had turned the page on the Clintons uh, and that he won without her by not he picking her it? VP. Why, why? I think he wanted to be magnanimous. I think he thought also it might be better to have her in the tent than outside the tent. Team of rivals. Yeah, and, and he believes in that concept as well, the Lincolnian uh, concept, I guess. But, but that also politically, <clears throat> it might have made sense to bring her in now uh, rather than having her in the Senate, maybe picking away at different things. Her people insist that she never would have done that, that she was on board. And you have to say in her defense um, that she campaigned a heck of a lot harder for him than I think any of her sharpest critics thought she would. <clears throat> Can she be a good Secretary of State, Arna? I think she'll be terrific. Do you? She also has a Deputy Secretary of State in the form of her husband. <laughs> and that's good or bad? <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's sure. a fact. I mean, he knows people all over the world. He knows uh, presidents, heads of state on uh, very personal terms. He's been traveling the world now for years. So obviously, that be, it's bound to be part of a, of a Hillary's uh, input. As Susan, she, what do you think? I thought it was especially surprising, given that he didn't even seriously consider her for vice president, much to the annoyance of the Clinton folks, didn't vet her for that job, uh, made it pretty clear that uh, he was going to go in a different direction, to then turn around and give her this most senior post in the cabinet, I thought was surprising. Now, the Clinton people argue that this is... Uh, an even better job than usual because Barack Obama will be so consumed with his first priorities, which is the nation's economy, that she's going to have an even more important role than secretaries of state always have. We'll see if that turns out to be true. Bill? I'm sure that Jim Steinberg, who actually is going to be Deputy Secretary of State, <laughs> will, be, will be happy to learn that Bill Clinton is really going to be Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, I didn't expect it. I don't think anyone expected maybe, I guess, the notion of, of Bob Gates being re, uh, reappointed had become fairly common by October or so of the campaign, but certainly the Clinton appointment, and to some degree the Jim Jones appointment, or a surprise, he probably could have made a lot of money if he had gotten all three for a trifecta, <laughs> which is a good, good, always a good reminder of how surprising politics is in all kinds of ways, and that everyone follows these things so closely. And you're right, when he didn't pick Hillary for vice president, which I actually thought would have been a rational, a logical pick politically, and Kennedy, Johnson, Reagan, Bush, the, to pick her then for Secretary of State uh, was interesting and bold. It's going to be interesting to see how the team works. I think Jim Jones is the one I'm most curious about. I mean, he is a very bright guy, a very impressive guy. Um, but I can't say this with Brent sitting here. I mean, National Security Advisor is a staff job, and it's a tough job. And it's not really the life of I, – I, would, I wouldn't say that being a four-star general for six or eight or ten years is necessarily the best preparation for being National Security Advisor. Uh, he's a very able guy, and maybe he can serve that role. But he's not – you know, he's used to having – 30 people hopping to on his, you know, to carry out his slightest whim. He's not used to hopping to when the president buzzes him at 6 o'clock in the morning because something's happened in the world, and then figuring out how to get Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates and the CIA director um, on board. The other thing that strikes me is who hasn't been appointed yet? I guess DNI and CIA. Mm -hmm. Do we know yeah. that DNI is Admiral Blair, or that's at least the rumor? It's right? the rumor, yeah. But no CIA. I think that's a tough appointment for him because the truth is, um, what does the left most hate about the Bush presidency? Guantanamo, torture, you know, eavesdropping, uh, the, the, that part of the war on terror, the, the homeland security part. And I think yeah. he's got a very tough line to, 
to, to he's going to get he's getting briefings, which I believe, and I know nothing. I'm not you know cleared for anything, are making him slightly less unsympathetic <laughs> to some of the things that Bush may have done. I would say, and to the intelligence that's acquired through various of these means, and he's. God knows he wants to protect the country, and he, but he also has views, and is he campaigned on a certain criticism of everything that Bush did. And I think those are going to be, a, I think A, that's going to be tough to fill with the right person, and B, that person's going to have a very delicate line to, to walk, as is the Justice Department, and sort of figuring out what to do on the kind of homeland security Do you want to add anything side. on that? Well, I was surprised by the Clinton appointment as well, but I, I think it, it tended to confirm for me he really doesn't care that much about foreign policy. Uh, in other words, he wanted a strong figure over there, uh, and uh, uh, what by one you get two, like Arno said. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, is intriguing to me now is, is uh, uh, speaking of deputy secretaries of state, uh, uh, Susan Rice uh, parking her own transition team over at state uh, makes me wonder uh, what's going to happen there. But we ha have a uh, you know, branch office for the United Nations ambassador uh, here as well. But uh, uh, it's become a cliche among pundits that where the Clintons go, you have drama. <laughs> Clichés are based on truth. <laughs> is, so I'm waiting to see what's going to happen. I, I wonder, and I'll say this in a serious way, if, if he, he knows he's got his hands full with the domestic policy, but if he really wants to make an effort to find some sort of peace settlement in the Middle East, mm -hmm. you make Hillary Clinton the Secretary of State, and you put her in charge of that, and you, you're going to have political problems. I mean, you, you can't get that done without some political problems. You're going to get criticism from the right by making her Secretary of State and kind of the point person. And I wonder if you give yourself a little additional political cover, at least on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I right. wonder if that has something to do uh, with what this appointment is about. I mean, I think she's eminently qualified. It may come in handy if Bibi Netanyahu wins, as he uh, seems to be ahead right now. I, I, I don't buy the argument uh, that he... I mean, I, Charles Scott never made this point, too, and mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't really care about foreign policy or he's going to be so preoccupied with the economy. I mean, you know, he may not care about foreign policy, but foreign policy is going to care about him. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and oh, yeah. I, I think he knows that. I'd say I don't know the president-elect at all, but people I know well who have worked with him and briefed him say actually he does care quite a lot about foreign policy. He's educated himself uh, quite extensively, and I, I think he's all presidents – well, all presidents during the Cold War and all presidents, I think, in a post-9-11 environment when you've got troops deployed in two different parts of the world, et cetera, mm -hmm. are going to have to be foreign policy presidents. And I, and I think he's genuine. I give him credit. He's tried to have a very strong team. Uh, yeah. And I think he's willing to have a strong team. And um, Bill, what I, happened, I, to, I, what happened to Richard Danzig in this uh, lineup? Because he was mentioned for all sorts of I don't know. top Does positions. He, and then his name just dropped off uh, all the list. Does he get Deputy Secretary of Defense? Wow. I guess they're mm -hmm. negotiating yeah. the Gates. I mean, it's unusual to have a holdover across party lines. And so I, I guess Secretary Gates has said his team will, his current team will leave and Democrats will come in. But he, of course, has to have people he's comfortable with, too. Well, and also, if he, if he puts the guy that everybody thinks is going to yeah, succeed it's a little weird. the deputy, right. he's going to walk in there with no power mm -hmm. whatsoever because mm -hmm. everybody will be going to see the deputy. Right. So I think that'll be quite a problem. Well, let's go mm -hmm. to some uh, questions out here. Susan Adams, you're close to the mic. First, I would like to thank Bob because I can finally watch all you guys without having, and lady, without having to switch the channel on Sunday morning and miss the ad. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, I think one of the challenges that this administration is going to face is how do you remodel the economic political system, UN system, to reflect the power of the BRIC countries and so on. Doha ended, which got very little attention, the multilateral trade negotiations because China and India simply refused to step up to the plate and assume more obligations consistent with their development. We all know how well China's doing financially during this financial crisis. We do know that in the UN they've been discussing how they're going to reapportion, um, how they're going to reapportion the Security Council or change it. I'd be interested in your views on these issues. Thank you. We'd like oh, to. Uh, Steve Landy, Manchester Trade, push and do so. Okay. It, it seems to me that inevitably we're going to have to go back and look at what happened at Bretton Woods after World War II and new economic and financial architecture for the whole world is going to have to be gradually put into place. Today, we're dependent very much on China, whether China is still willing to be our banker. And uh, they've got major problems with their own middle class at this point. And they may have stimulus programs and that they've got for their own people before they help us. So all of this is coming to a head, it seems to me. We'll and, be on, and on the domestic side, I mean, we started with that. I'll just defend Bob's proposition that you know, foreign policy and domestic politics are related. I mean. We're going to have a very nasty recession over the next year. 
we have, a lot of us have fought against protectionism for 20 years in our own little ways and actually have won those fights pretty consistently. And the kind of, that's been the dog that has barked but never really bit, you know, people say, now there's going to be a, a resurgence of protectionism and isolationism and xenophobia. And truthfully, under uh, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, it never really has gotten that serious and administrations have basically been able to stay on a pretty free trade, pretty open to capital and investment, uh, pretty internationalist, we can quarrel about what kind of internationalist, but pretty internationalist agenda, um, pro-alliance, et cetera. I mean, I am worried that if we have a very, you know, we have not tested this proposition with 10% unemployment and with uh, um, uh, a year from now in our country or in other countries, incidentally. Right. If you, Doha failed in a good economic environment, so I'm pretty worried. And uh, this is a case where the president himself has a party that is not on board entirely, uh, free trade or freer trade. Uh, he even toyed with silly things, I think, like you know, going back, renegotiating NAFTA. I think that sort of disappeared for now. But I'm, I'm, I think that will be a domestic test of Obama uh, in and, his, and, and the Democratic Congress to some degree. USTR is another position I noticed that he hasn't actually. Yeah. Well, he, yeah. they've talked Where about he's torn yeah. between his base and yeah. what he, I think he thinks would be good governance. Because they've talked about mm -hmm. Congressman Becerra, who's sort of more towards the base, and now the name of Harold Ford Jr., the former congressman, has come up a little bit as a more centrist possible pick. Uh, well, and I think for USDR, as he was a oh, trade right. rep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, because, you know, you've got that push and pull there uh, within his own party, and, and you've seen the Colombian trade pact stall here at the end of the Bush right. administration. Uh, a lot of these trade pacts that people thought would sort of be a slam dunk, we have given the economy are not, not going through anymore. Next question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is Kami Bhatt. I write for the Pakistani Spectator. Uh, my question is about the article Mr. C uh, Crystal wrote last week. Uh, I, you seem to be drawing a parallel between Al Hamas and Al Taiba. And uh, uh, my question is do you really believe that they are parallel organizations, given that Al Hamas doesn't have any real country? It's a just an organization. Whereas Al Taiba has on its backing whole country, Pakistan. And how can we resolve this very difficult issue of Pakistan without addressing Pakistani insecurity that India is kind of encircling Pakistan before Pakistan has problem on its western borders and now it has problem on eastern border. According to Pakistani diplomats, they don't say in public, but they say in privately that there are hundreds of thousands of raw agents in Afghanistan who are trying to destabilize Pakistan through Balochistan. So unless we address that issue, unless we resolve Kashmir issue where 80,000 Kashmiri have been killed, they there is no way we are going to have peace in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. So it's like we are being so kind of wishy-washy about this resolving Kashmir issue. Do you really believe that we could do something about that without addressing Pakistani insecurity and Kashmir issue? Thanks. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> we need to have a big India-Pakistan debate. I don't think the people think I have huge insights on the India-Pakistan issue. No, I think that, let me put it this way. I think the mainstream view in America right now Whatever the historical comp complexities of Kashmir, or whatever the perhaps um, reasonable or unreasonable insecurities of Pakistan, I mean, what do they think India really is going to in invade Pakistan? I, I, I doubt it. Uh, Pakistan is a nuclear power. Um, that it is intolerable for, the pa for a government, a government either yeah, that the Bush doctrine in this respect I think has bipartisan support. Terror groups that are hosted in a country that are visible and that are unquestionably engaged in terror activities either the host government has to crack down on them or there has to be the possibility of intervention to crack down on them. And one cannot ask India to sit there when people come from Pakistan in a, from an organization that clearly, with which there's clearly been collaboration of parts of the deep government of Pakistan, not the current civilian government, uh, and just say, well, that's fine. That's just the price of doing business. That's, that's nothing can be done about that. And I think in terms of both that and the Pakistan-Afghanistan situation, I think, um, I just think the United States at least is going to expect some greater control of and pressure over on the, the, the domestic uh, uh, terror groups in Pakistan. That doesn't mean that maybe that can be combined with some new diplomatic initiatives to reassure Pakistan, but we have been pretty generous. I mean, the US, this U.S. administration has been pretty forthcoming towards Pakistan, pretty generous with Pakistan. Has been but well, we can't resolve Kashmir, and it's not clear that there is, I mean, that the status quo is going to change in Kashmir. Sure. Very quickly, if I could add, Pakistan, to understand Pakistan, where I've been going in and out since 1962, uh, two of their four provinces until last February 18th were governed by a coalition of six political religious extremists. 
I met with the chief minister in Peshawar. He told me that he is a great admirer of Mullah Omar, of the Taliban, and that he had a great deal of esteem for Osama bin Laden. And he was running a whole province. Same thing in Balutistan. We also forget that the madrasas, uh, about 12,000 of them, are still producing about 100,000 kids a year, young boys, who have grown up to hate America, hate Israel, and hate India. It's a huge problem. Good evening, Joe Madden, Saved Our Four Coalition. Thanks for all coming out tonight. Um, you guys talked briefly about the top three or four priorities, and we are wondering where do cases of mass atrocities like Congo and Darfur fit in? And if not in the top three, what kind of resources should be given to this? Well, I think uh, Bill mentioned uh, Susan Rice, or, or no, I'm sorry, Clarence yeah. mentioned Susan Rice uh, having a very active role as a U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations if she's confirmed. And she's spoken openly about paying a lot more attention to those uh, huge problem. So I think that that's, that's one sign. And also, uh, Joe Biden, you know, as a presidential candidate, talked a lot about intervention uh, in dealing with genocide. Uh, and he's somebody we haven't really mentioned so far. As you talk about the team, how he's going to fit in is another big question. I mean, he was picked as VP to sort of check the box on foreign policy uh, and maybe thought he was going to be the primetime player on that. And then he started looking around the room and saying, well, Gates is here and Clinton and, and, and General Jones. And you sort of have to wonder, um, whether or not Joe Biden is really going to have a big seat at the table or not. And I, I just, uh, well, I mean, look, I think that's a very good question. I mean, mm -hmm. we talked about Afghanistan and Iran are ultimately maybe bigger strategic issues, but uh, Obama could face serious choices, obviously Darfur, which is a long-term ongoing problem, but he has explicitly said, if I'm not mistaken, he'll be more aggressive. He's talked about a no-fly zone, right. putting a cap on Darfur, which uh, on, yeah, on yeah. Sudan, which, I mean, I myself have been for for four years, but I mean, that's fine <laughs> if he wants to do it. He'll have the support of all the neocons he ran against and, uh, and of liberal internationalists. Uh, what about Zimbabwe? I mean, it wouldn't be, would it be crazy to think that the first deployment of U.S. troops under Obama could be, you know, 10,000 troops as part of an international force, presumably including African Union and NATO forces, into Zimbabwe to restore order and to take care of a, you know, newly deposed, uh, as hopefully, Mugabe government there? I mean, so I very much agree with the notion that uh, I mean, a, I think Africa, between Zimbabwe and Darfur, and uh, the pirates off Somalia and Congo, I mean, they're really a huge, it's, they're, that is the place where Bush is leaving, not it's Bush's fault, I don't think, but he's leaving Obama a very, a lot of very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. And I think it will be an interesting test of where he is, just personally as a president, on the sort of humanitarian intervention uh, issue more broadly. Susan Rice deeply regrets, obviously, I take it her position in 1994, when she uh, argued against intervention in Rwanda, mm -hmm. uh, will that translate into an actual intervention in one of these other cases? I think one of the questions he's going to have, though, is does he have the troops to do that mm -hmm. if he so chose? Yeah. And uh, you also yeah. can't do everything. Uh, it's not that anyone is in favor of genocide, of course not, but uh, you come in with all these pressing problems uh, and with probably, as I don't I forget, Bill maybe said, uh, some challenge from some place we, we aren't predicting now, from Russia or from, uh, from some other uh, hot spot that chooses to challenge a new president. Um, and I think one of the characteristics, we, one of the things we've learned about Obama is he's pretty disciplined. Uh, he's able to focus on his priorities. Uh, that sometimes involves making tough choices. Um, I, I, I guess the deployment of troops to some new battleground seems to me not something he would want to do in the opening months of his administration. Especially if you consider the country like the Congo, is one third the size of the United States, superimposed on a map of the United States that would go from Maine to Florida and from Manhattan to the Mississippi River. I can't imagine getting involved in such a situation. One issue that hasn't come up yet but has been touched on peripherally is the whole business of U.S. Agency for International Development. There's been some talk of getting a cabinet post to represent aid issues. It's been a real challenge over the past administration, what its role is, who sits at the table. I wonder what the thinking is that you folks hear about what's going to happen to U.S. foreign assistance and U.S. AID. Interesting. I mean, uh, um, it's funny. A Bush official the other day was, was mentioning me that in the – um, in all of the debates uh, between McCain and, and Obama, the, the three debates, um, they all sort of duck the question of this financial crisis. What, does that change any of your priorities, your spending? Um, except for Joe Biden in the vice presidential debate, w was apparently at one point when he was asked that question, he said something to the effect of, we're probably not going to be able to do as much with foreign aid as we had wanted to. Uh, and this point, person was pointing out to, to make the point that President Bush, as part of his legacy, has really tried to make a big deal and rightly so, about what he's done to fight malaria in Africa, what he's done to fight HIV, HIV AIDS around the world. 
uh, very unexpected, um, even by some of his own supporters. And he's been this active on these issues. And he went to Africa with the president earlier this year. But there you have Biden, who sort of, uh, you know, prides himself on his foreign policy credentials, saying that maybe we'll have to cut foreign aid. And so I'm not certain um, that um, that doesn't mean it's going to follow through on that. But I don't know that the prospects are, are great for vast increases of those resources when you have Biden making a statement like that, number one, as a candidate. Uh, but number two, the, the budget crisis that is ballooning where, you know, estimates of a trillion dollar annual deficit, it's always sort of one of the things that's on the chopping block. I think mm -hmm. foreign aid is going to be very, a very difficult sell, as wrong as that might be. I mean, there's just no money. And when you look at, they're talking about now a, a public works program that could cost up to a trillion dollars, uh, there's just simply going to have to be some priorities there, uh, no matter how worthy some of these causes are. I, th I think it's going to be a very difficult sell. President Bush increased foreign aid, and of course, poor President Bush, he gets no credit for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, he, he did more than any, I believe, liberal or democratic president has done, both on the humanitarian side and on the strategic side of, of foreign aid. Um, I, don't, I sort of agree with Bob, the, the amount of money there. But I, look, trade helps, trade helps as much as or more than aid, and you could make a case that something like Colombia Free Trade or some of the other CAFTA, some of the other free trade agreements, I had in Africa, I would say, I don't know no expert on this at all, but you can make a case that reducing some of our own uh, barriers to imports would do as much good as any particular foreign aid. And there I do worry that Obama, Bush tried to do some stuff and couldn't do as quite as much as he hoped. Uh, I'm not sure how much stomach there'll be for that either here at home. So I, 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 I think that's worrisome. Yeah. Hi, Adam Landsman from Booz Allen Hamilton. I asked this question in a personal capacity, but uh, I was wondering what you felt about the uh, increasingly assertive and aggressive stance from Russia and how that will play into the next administration's foreign policy choices. Susan, why don't you get into that? Well, it's a, of course, it could be one of the great challenges of a, res a resurgent Russia. We've kind of gotten used to not having, having Russia as an ally, or at least not as somebody who's causing us a lot of problems. That uh, seems to be, uh, you know, turning around now. Um, and uh, with all kinds of complications with uh, mm -hmm. NATO uh, allies and with uh, with our new friends in in, uh, in the former Soviet satellite republics. Um, I don't know. You know more about this uh, than I do. I uh, take a rather the opposite view. I think that we uh, should have invited Russia to join NATO right at the end of the Cold War. That would have kept them on the straight and narrow as they moved or felt their way towards some kind of democratic regime. And I also think we tend to forget how we would have reacted had we lost the Cold War. And we suddenly see that Mexico and Canada have joined the Warsaw Pact. All of Europe is now Comic Con. And suddenly, the Russians are putting in radars and missiles in Puerto Rico and in the Bahamas. I think we'd be pretty upset. And I think we mishandled the whole situation. We should have sat down with the Russians, told them what our concerns were about Iran and the uh, incoming missiles from Iran that would threaten Europe just as much as the United States, but at least sit down and discuss it as a common problem. Don't you think, I mean, and I've just asked this of the panel, that we need to just totally reassess our policy toward Russia. Uh, Senator Nunn, who is chairman of the CSIS, uh, during our last session here, said we need to make a list of things that we need Russia's help on, and Russia needs to make a list of things that they need our help on, and then we ought to have some serious talks about things that we can work on together. It seems to me like this, this is a problem that's kind of gone in the ditch, that there might be some ways, uh, some things that could be done to just get this in a better situation than it is right now. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Marilyn Erwitz, just here in a private capacity. Um, Dennis Ross uh, was very active in campaigning for uh, President-elect Obama. Uh, I had the impression, just from all of that, that perhaps he would have a role in this administration. I haven't heard anything uh, concerning that, uh, and of course, he had been in the Clinton administration, and I'm sure that uh, uh, potential Secretary of State Clinton uh, wouldn't perhaps well, I wouldn't think, be too happy. I think, frankly, he may still have a role. But it's, that's, that's what I was going to but, ask. Do any of you have a role? Thing, like the, great thing yeah. about, the great thing about Hillary Clinton unexpectedly becoming Secretary of State and Jim Jones, somewhat unexpectedly becoming National Security Advisor, and keeping Gates is that three premier jobs were filled up with people who were not really from the Democratic foreign policy establishment, 
Um, so everyone else has now been pushed down a, a, a notch, which is sort of amusing. Again, if you, you know, if you're a close friend of Dick Holbrook, it's a funny time. So, um, now I'm going to get a phone call. Last time I made this joke in public, I got a phone call the next day from Richard Holbrook complaining that I had mentioned him in this context. But no, but I mean a lot of very good people, and I'm a friend of Dennis's, and and, of, and let me hasten to say, Richard Holbrook, um, a lot of very able people, you know, were competing for. I mean, if you're at that level, you're going to you expect a pretty high level job. I think Dennis. I think he said this on wasn't he would like I mean he could go back to being the Middle East envoy, especially if he were also given Iran. I mean I think Dennis has spent a lot of time working on Iran, trying to figure out a diplomatic solution to Iran. I'm a little dubious about some of those solutions. Can you make the Saudis, you know, can you have a deal where the Saudis sort of pressure the Chinese to get tough on Iran because the Saudis supply so much Chinese oil, there are all these complicated diplomatic schemes, which Dennis is good at. And um, maybe that would be a role. But I think there will be people who we will all have expected to see in this administration who won't be in, at least for the first two years, of course, then there'll be a shakeup and things will happen, uh, just because of the uh, kind of accident of having Senator Clinton become Secretary of State and, and, and Jones become National Security Advisor and, uh, and Gates stay at defense. And of course, I think there's an assumption that the, the Obama administration moved much, much more quickly on a Middle East, Middle East front than the, the Bush administration did. And in that way, Dennis Ross would be, you know, need no transition. Uh, into filling that kind of role. Another name, too, could be Secretary Colin Powell. And people around him say that, despite all speculation about a cabinet post, that there's really highly unlikely he'd do a cabinet post. But he would be open to President-elect Obama reaching out to him to be a Mideast envoy, be a troubleshooter and something like that. And maybe based on some of his experience in the Bush cabinet, he, he might want to do that. Bill Clinton I has a little experience there, too. Yeah. He does? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I believe Dennis Ross will always be an influence on any administration. Uh, that is there just because he is so so highly regarded. So I wouldn't uh, worry uh, that he's not going to be a part of this. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mark Stuckert from the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Thank the panel and Mr. Skolkroff for the remarks and this uh, gathering. It's absolutely terrific. And also CSIS for co-hosting. Um, we've talked a lot about smart power and soft power uh, here at CSIS and uh, you've already addressed the foreign assistance uh, question that I thought I might bring up, but can you say a little bit about energy security? Thank you. Who'd like to talk about that? Well, energy mm. security is something that uh, General Jones has been working on now uh, at the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he's just come out with a major plan, not for energy independence, because I don't think any such thing is possible, but very much in keeping with what uh, President Obama will be talking about, and which he talked about today when he appointed the new uh, energy uh, secretary, and that is uh, wind power, solar power, uh, all these things are coming down at great speed. There's a lot. Today you can uh, do a house in solar power for $24,000, and it can be brought down with a government push, brought down to $5,000 very, very quickly. And there are hundreds of thousands of miles of rooftops in the United States. All of this is going to change dramatically over the next five to ten years. I think there's a strange circumstance where you know, with gas prices coming down so much, and we see in some cases in this area, dollar eighty, two dollars a gallon. Um, it's good for people in the middle of a recession, obviously, to pay a lot less at the pump instead of four dollars, four dollars and fifty cents a gallon. But I don't see the same urgency that people had six, eight months ago when it was four dollars a gallon. There was a lot of people talking about signing up with General Jones for some sort of a plan, any plan, uh, and everyone seemed focused on it now. And you don't really hear. I mean, as you mentioned, I think Clarence at the beginning. President like Obama was unveiling his energy team, and it was sort of a okay. Yeah. I don't it's see the urgency. how fast the well, not only how fast the gas prices went up and then down again, but how fast the public enthusiasm for energy conservation went up and down just as fast. Absolutely, the, the whole debate is like off the public conversation right now. It's amazing. I mean, this mention of Jones does raise one point, which I, I've been struck by just in the last couple of days about Obama's way of staffing up. I mean, I think Jones will be key on energy security. I think he'll be key in general. Actually, I'd say there's been more. If I had to pick one person to follow closely over the next six months in terms of Obama's foreign policy, I think I'd follow Jones a little more than actually uh, either Gates or Including or his Clinton. experiment in uh, the but, West Bank, Janine. Yeah, well, he knows a lot about that, too. I mean, I, they're not going to do anything, certainly, until the Israeli elections. And I think, actually, Obama has said over and over he knows Iran is the fundamental short-term issue, short-medium-term issue. And since there's not going to be an Arab-Palestinian-Israeli uh, agreement in the next six, nine, 12 months, I think he'll focus more on Iran. But Think of the appointments he's made. I mean, he's, Larry Summers is going to be is the economic star in the White House. Jones is national security advisor. Carol Browner's environmental star in the White House, and there's an, a dash who's double headed with a, as the White House health person. It's the strong. It's an attempt, I would say, to have the strongest White House staff 
uh, in my memory. I mean, it's sort of amazing to double, and he's now doubling appointments. I mean, there is an energy secretary. He doesn't have to have an energy <laughs> star in the White House. There is an EPA administrator. He doesn't, there hasn't been a tradition of having a very strong environmental person. I think I'm even forgetting maybe one other area where he's going to have a sort of White House czar. And he's got a very strong chief of staff. Um, I mean, it'll be fun to be in these White House senior <laughs> staff meetings. I mean, think of it. I'm serious. Rahm Emanuel, Larry Summers, Jim Jones. I mean, these are not Carol Browner, who has strong views. And I don't think Carol Browner's views on the trade-off between economic growth and uh, going to a green uh, you know, energy or a green economy are going to be the same as Larry Summers. But I think uh, that tells me that Obama, I mean, I, I assume what he wants is White House-driven policy. I don't think he's putting a lot of cabinet secretaries out there and saying, go do your own thing. Um, that can be, you know, that can be impressive and it can be strong. It can be a recipe for real uh, disaster. I mean, you, you know, we, he's thought, we thought Powell yeah. Rumsfeld was a tough fight, but I mean, think, <laughs> think of some of the, the, the tensions he's building in mm. by having some of these people in the White House and then also with strong cabinet secretaries. And I mean, that deputy mm -hmm. secretary of state. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. He's trying to replicate Hyde Park in the White House is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's have, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, Stephen Piper, Piper Pacific International. Maybe just following up on this last point, uh, some critics of the Pentagon have sometimes accused it of being an independent sovereign state that uh, doesn't need to deal with the rest of the government. I think one of the interesting comments that I've heard Secretary Gates say, and quite different from his predecessor, is that one of the needs for national security, which is his principal responsibility, is to increase the Foreign Service Officer Corps and to increase the size of uh, AID. I think he was kind of famous for saying that uh, DOD has more mm -hmm. lawyers than uh, USAID has permanent staff. More musicians, mm -hmm. too. And more musicians in marching bands in the military than we have uh, foreign service officers. Is, That's good. That's is, this going, yeah. is this going to be reflective, or might this be reflective of a mm. more comprehensive, integrated approach to national security, that it isn't all military, but I, I that think diplomacy is. is a critical I element of it? I think that is their goal. I mean, and I think it's a worthy goal. And, now, and Gates was saying this in How far they'll get with this, I mean, mm -hmm. is something else. But in my own sense of it is that this is where they are, and this is what they're going to talk about. Yeah, I think this is uh, uh, the whole direction of Obama's positions during the debates, during the campaigns, uh, and uh, sometimes he took he took uh, uh, heat for it. But uh, uh, I expect his first uh, dramatic move uh, in foreign policy may well be to lift the Cuba travel restrictions and uh, uh, make make the kind of kind of dramatic uh, move that um, sends positive signals uh, through Latin America may lead to a lifting of the embargo and. Uh, lead to uh, some economic stimulus as well because of the very fact that so much of uh, uh, South Florida, uh, uh, well, in, in, in Miami, the Cubans under age 30 went two to one for Obama. It's just uh, an astounding um, uh, show of what's happened over the last 50 years. So he, he feels like our, our foreign policy needs to be modernized. And he's going to make a speech, we know, in the first 100 days from a Muslim capital, um, which is a very powerful statement about mm -hmm. the use of diplomacy as well as the military. and in talking to <coughs> friends and adversaries. He should make it to Baghdad, of course, but we'll see if he, well, which is now the freest capital in the Arab world, but um, maybe he won't. I just, I mean, I think it's such a bum rap that <laughs> Bush is having a militaristic foreign policy. What exactly was, you know, fine. No one quarrels with Afghanistan. There was one war that we can quarrel about Iraq, and the rest of it was all diplomacy. What exactly was Condi doing in the second term with Iran? What was she doing with North Korea, agree or disagree? She tried to increase the size of the Foreign Service. She tried to, we, they did increase foreign aid. She tried to increase AID and improve it. I think she took, made a real efforts on a lot of the soft power stuff. The U.S. Mil the Defense Department, so far from being a world in itself, does a lot of the soft power stuff in the U.S. government now because the rest of the government can't do it. Now, if Obama wants to spend some serious time overhauling state to make it an operational agency, you know, that war power to him, if he wants to really try to get justice, to have a rule of, to have serious people in justice who are deployable abroad to do rule of, rule of law missions, more power to them. That's not the, traditionally the way these agencies have been set up. They're, those cultures are very hard to change. And um, the truth is, you know, you end up in Iraq in a tough situation, you end up in Afghanistan, it turns out you send out the lieutenants and the captains, and they do the diplomacy and they do the economic development, partly because in those situations, you know, having military assets behind you is, is helpful. But, I think there's a lot of easy talk, frankly, about this, you know, build, beefing up the civilian soft power side of the U.S. government. Really making that happen would take a huge effort that I'm not sure the administration is ready for. Given the crises they're facing, it's going to be hard to spend time on, I think. But you have a Secretary of Defense who's 
was talking about this publicly in July, at least in July, if not before. Yeah, I mean, and as I think uh, Bob said, you know, there's no doubt that they have that goal, but will they have the money to back it up? You know, it's not a question of uh, just uh, soft power. The last one. Yeah. You call it smart power, which is a conjugation of soft and hard power. All right, mm -hmm. let's go to one more question because we are getting the clock running out here. Thank you, my. Uh, my name is Yan Wen, the fellow, uh, visiting fellow of CSS here. I have been following up the, uh, the series uh, m every month. I learned a lot. Thank you, thank you very much. Very interactive for this one. My question is, uh, how do you guys uh, uh, expect the uh, President, uh, President-elect elect Obama's uh, first trip? Somebody, a lot of media here says the first trip should be to go to the China, but the, uh, ch According to the, uh, I mean the uh, U.S. Uh, China issue experts here, they said U.S.-China relations goes very smoothly. It's not on the top of the agenda to go to China. What's your comment on that? Thank well, you. Good. Anybody wants to take that? But I've heard the first trip. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us have any idea. But I've heard that Indonesia is at the top of the list right now, which would make a lot of sense, given given the fact that he uh, spent some of his childhood in Indonesia, and that Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, and also <coughs> seems to have kept uh, its uh, homegrown terrorists under control. Mm -hmm. I think in early April he's supposed mm -hmm. to go to a um, uh, fi um, financial G summit um, in Britain. <coughs> he's been invited um, by the Prime Minister. Uh, and I think it's going to be interesting, we're talking about all these important <laughs> issues that he's got to attack, whether it's Russia, China, Iran. But if he's globetrotting his first year a lot in the middle of a recession back home, he's going to face a lot of domestic pressure. So he's got, mm -hmm. you know, as you were saying before, I mean, there's only one commander in chief. And so he can only farm so much of that out to Secretary Clinton and others. He's got to do some of it himself. Uh, there is only one commander in chief. But on the other hand, I think there's going to be a lot of domestic pressure with the recession to, to not be globetrotting. So it's a push and a pull there. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for coming. On behalf of the <laughs> thank you. Thank you.